Hi and welcome to TRT World's flagship arts and culture program, Showcase. On today's episode, we'll tell you how the historical heritage of Turkey's city of Hasan Kaif is no longer at risk thanks to the relocation of the AUB Mosque. But first, Istanbul aims to be a literary hub. We look at how the city is attracting publishers from around the world. We head over to Gaza to take a look and listen to the city's only grand piano. In the realm of the unknown, we head to London to vividly reimagine myths and legends through the eyes of Edward Burne Jones. Herkesin kanlı dediği, herkesin korktuğu sen, sen benim babamsın. We look at why this Turkish movie about Vlad the Impaler has been given a plus 18 rating in Germany. Say you're a non-Turkish speaker living in Tokyo. You probably aren't reading the newest bestseller in Strabzon. Well, here in Istanbul, an initiative is taking place to open up a world of literature in a variety of different languages. The aim of the annual Istanbul Fellowship Program is to bring together Turkish and foreign publishers and hopefully translate a multitude of books into new markets. The fair will see 200 participants from around 70 countries and those numbers keep climbing. Well, let's talk to Zeynep Alp, the editor and foreign rights manager at EDAM, a publishing company based right here in Istanbul. Thank you so much for being with us today, Zeynep. Thank you for having now, me. Now, first off, tell me about uh, what the fellowship program is and what type of people we can see at this program. The fellowship program is a professional organization that brings together publishers from around the world. Uh, we, our aim is to introduce the Turkish market to foreign publishers and for them to eat meet each other. So can we get the foreign market coming here as well? Yes. It's like a vice versa. Yes, we of... want the Istanbul Fellowship to become a hub for the copyright market from around the world. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what can we expect from the 2019th edition of the uh, fellowship program? It's, it's its fourth edition, if I'm yes. not uh, yes. mistaken. It's very new, but we have around 400 applications from 90 countries. Uh, we bring editors, publishers, agencies, and people representing publishing different publishing societies. So it, we want this to become uh, one of the leading markets of copyright sales in the world. Now, Zainab, tell me about uh, where else in the world that we can see programs like this and where Turkey stands uh, in this sector. Well, this is uh, actually a unique fellowship program because it's organized by a publishing society. There is a large fellowship like this in Sharjah and there is one in Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, the fellowship programs are generally quite small. Uh, like in Frankfurt, for example, they bring around uh, 17 to 20 editors and publishers from around the world and they introduce the German market to these people. But here, our aim is to bring uh, all different publishers from around the world, large and small, and give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, we bring small publishers as well, as with, together with very large publishers. So this is a great opportunity for them to get to know the publishing industry from around the world and different trends. And the publishing societies come together and they talk about the future of the, of the publishing in the industry. Uh, like the new trends, uh, audiobooks, ebooks, and uh, management strategies within wow, the field. Wow, so it's, it's a really good platform for emerging publishers as well to network with well based publishers yes. in, the, in the market. Yes. Um, now, translators also play a huge role uh, in this market as well, I'm guessing, because yes. it's being translated uh, from one language to the next. Tell yes. me about the role that they play and the importance of translators. Translators are very important because when you have a work that you want to introduce to a, to a new culture, you have to make sure you translate it correctly, uh, but also sometimes you have to do uh, localization as well, especially with children's publications. So translators are very important. And we have uh, grants for translations. The Turkish Minister of Culture provides the TEDA grant. 
uh, to publishers who would like to publish, translate Turkish books, Turkish literature into different languages. Mm -hmm. And the works of translators are vi vital in this uh, situation. If I'm not mistaken, you've translated yes. your fair share of books as well. Yes. How, how is that process? How's that experience? It uh, depends on the book. It's, very, it's fun, but it can be very stressful as well. Uh, I've translated from both Turkish to English and English to Turkish. And I've even translated uh, one children's book from Arabic to Turkish. Wow. And it's, it's really fun, but it's a very uh, long process, especially if it's um, a non-fiction or fiction book for adults. Uh, that's a long process. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Yeah. Now tell me a bit about the access that uh, this fellowship program gives to the publishing market and how many people can actually be exposed uh, to Turkish literature due to this program? Uh, we bring uh, a lot of publishers here. Like this year, we are going to choose 200 publishers. Mm -hmm. And when they come, they learn about the market and they go back to their country and they become, in a way, our representatives in their country because they talk about the fellowship program. Uh, and many publishers in Turkey who do not have the opportunity to attend international fairs get to introduce their books and their publications to all these foreign publishers. And it's been a great opportunity for a lot of publishers in Turkey. I can imagine. Um, now, another aspect uh, that highlights this program is the funding uh, for foreign publishers. Tell me a bit about that. Uh, we have uh, three different uh, packages. The first package is fully paid everything flight and uh, accommodation, translation fees, uh, tr translator's fees. Mm -hmm. And the second package is uh, accommodation. And the third package is for people who would like to come themselves, but all their fees during the fellowship program are funded uh, by the program itself. Zeynep Pipe, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase and sharing your insight on the Istanbul Fellowship Program. Thank you very much for having me. Taking center stage after a decade of silence is Gaza's only grand piano. Damaged during an Israeli airstrike, restoration experts have been traveling to the Gaza Strip during the past four years. And now the instrument is ready to perform once again in front of audiences. For many in Gaza, this will be the first time they hear a grand piano live. A feat given that public gatherings have not been a common place in the past decade. It's the first time I've seen a piano concert. I liked it very much because it's a new thing in Gaza. I'm so grateful for the support we get. And I feel there's so much interaction with Palestine. This is so beautiful. But while the music is indeed beautiful, the history of this piano has a sad song. Having survived the Israeli airstrikes in 2014, the piano was actually silenced years before, when Hamas took over the Gaza Strip and banned non-religious concerts. It took a concerted effort to convince the local government to have a change of heart for the sake of diplomatic relations. So the, we discussed about this issue with the Ministry of Culture, and the so Ministry of Culture the kindly uh, they requested to host this concert to appreciation for Japanese government for this piano. Now, after years of restoration, the instrument has found its sound once again. At the Palestine Red Crescent Society Theatre Hall, local and Japanese musicians teamed up to celebrate with a look towards the future. Our students who graduate year after year need to play the piano. It has great artistic value since it's the only grand piano in Gaza. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of the arts and culture. Relocation of the AUB Mosque has started in Turkey's historical city of Hasankeyf. With the mosque's relocation, most of Hasankeyf's historical heritage will be saved from being submerged due to a nearby dam project. 
AUB Mosque is one of the last historical monuments that are moved to a new cultural park, which is three kilometers away from the original site. UNESCO has accepted traditional Korean wrestling to be recognized as an intangible cultural heritage. The recognition came as a result of North and South Korea's joint application, a first ever in the history of Korea's cultural heritage. The two Koreas had initially submitted separate bids for a place in UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list, which aims to pay tribute to traditional crafts and skills since 2003. American publishing house Abrams Books has cancelled the publication of its new graphic novel, A Suicide Bomber Sits in the Library, following a barrage of criticism. The book was severely condemned on social media for being unapologetically Islamophobic. Abrams later said they recognized the harm and offense felt by many at a time when stereotypes breed division rather than discourse. The Romanian prince Vlad Tsepesh was known as the Impaler. As you can tell, he was one bad dude. So much so, some say he was the inspiration for the movie villain Dracula. Now, a new Turkish movie brings a different, non-supernatural depiction of Vlad and chronicles his rivalry with the Ottoman Empire. But the film has been given a restrict plus 18 rating in Germany for what the country's rating system calls extreme levels of Turkish nationalism. We'll discuss that aspect in a moment, but first let's take a look at the film. Some critics argue that the cinematic mythification of Vlad the Impaler is a problem. They claim it dwarfs his atrocities in the 1400s. The movie Delilaj, meaning the crazies, take Vlad out of the horror genre, in which he's a common staple and portrays the ever-enduring character through the lens of war action cinema. It's been lauded by Turkish fans for bringing to the screen a gritty, realist version of the man with a fondness for spears. So who then are the crazies? The crazies in this film are a special operations squad that belong to the Ottoman military. In the movie, they take it upon themselves to put an end to the cruelty of the Romanian prince. Currently, the film is number two at the national box office, being the latest success in a series of historic adventure movies in Turkey. Why? Well, audiences seem to be drawn to the movie's polished special effects, makeup and costumes. And then there's the acting. The main attraction for ticket buyers is veteran actor Erkan Petekaya's portrayal of the infamous villain. And what Petekaya says is his embrace of the realistic, vicious approach to the character. While the crazies tackle Vlad, their nomadic mission is not yet over. The movie will be released in Germany and in wait local movie theaters later this week. Well, let's talk to Assistant Professor of Media Communications at Ibn Khaldun University, Tan Erdogan, who also teaches political communications and film analysis. Thank you so much for being with us on Showcase today, Tan Erd. Now, first off, tell me why Germany uh, made this movie uh, with a rating of 18+. plus. So, the movie Derilar, which is um, Mad Man in English, uh, is a cavalry unit of the Ottoman Empire in the late 15th century. So it's basically representing the struggle between Mehmed uh, II and mm -hmm. Vlad III. Okay. So this movie is basically representing how Dedilar, madmen, are using guerrilla tactics in order to defeat Vlad's army. Mm -hmm. So Germany uh, German authorities, specifically FSK, which is the self-regulatory body of the movie industry in Germany, mm -hmm. decided to classify the film as 18 plus. So the reason behind is uh, Turkish nationalism. Uh, so if we uh, consider the main aim of FSK, we see that there they are in charge of 
considering every single film and play which will be shown in the cinema mm -hmm. and uh, look, uh, consider if uh, this is um, based on the regulatories uh, for youth and mm -hmm. uh, children. Now let me ask you this, if this were to be a Hollywood production, and we've seen Hollywood productions like Troy and 300 before, um, that has you know the same amount of violence uh, and other motives, um, if it were to be a Hollywood production like the ones I've listed, do you think that they would treat it the same way? I mean, I can uh, mention two uh, epic historical films, uh, epic historical Hollywood productions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first one is uh, Gladiator, which was produced in 2000. And the second one is The Schindler's List, which was produced in... 1993. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can actually remember during that time when I was uh, studying uh, in high school, uh, our history class teacher uh, organized a trip uh, to a cinema in order to watch the Schindler's List because it was quite important in order to understand Germany's near history, spe mm -hmm. specifically after the Second World War, and uh, unfortunately, all the incidents happened to the Jews during that time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you consider these films, uh, we see that there is definitely a double standard. Well, definitely, in, in that sense, if you put it that way. Uh, so, I'm assuming you would consider this a form of uh, violating freedom of expression, in a sense. Certainly, we can, we can talk about uh, freedom of expression here. Um, I think we need to underline that cinema is about images. Cin cinema is about representation. Cinema is about historical incidents. Cinema is about political uh, ideas or uh, ideologies. So, in this regard, um, it's definitely a violation of freedom of expression. Uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, cinema is uh, the way how directors can deliver their message. Uh, so I think in this regard, it's important uh, to underline that uh, directors, uh, producers should be able to deliver the message as they wish. Mm -hmm. And it's not just cinema, I'm assuming, that is treated in the sense, you know, you uh, lived in Germany and you're a Turk as well, uh, you can really feel that division uh, among the country between the Turks and the Germans, don't you? Indeed. I mean, uh, there are lots of uh, incidents happening every single day. So if we consider uh, Hatzkav, for example, it's partly banned in some federal states in Germany for mm. uh, Muslim teachers, for mm. example. On the other hand, uh, two days ago, I have seen, uh, I've read a news actually, which uh, was about a children, um, uh, 10 years old children. Um, during, uh, during the class, uh, the teacher uh, asked him uh, if uh, the president of Turkey is his president or the president of Germany is his president. Oh, wow. So this is quite So it's quite taken all the way into the classrooms even. Uh, definitely, the definitely. On the other hand, if uh, French children is starting a sentence in German, uh, but finishing in French, it's charming. Whereas uh, when a Turkish child is starting a sentence in German um, and s finishing in Turkish, it's, the lack, it's called as lack of um, integration. Mm -hmm. So this kind of incidents are happening every single day in Germany. Tanar, tell me where else we can see the limitations that's been made to Delilar in other uh, movies or films that's trying, that has been tried to be aired uh, in Germany. I think in particular in the last couple of years, we see uh, lots of restrictions in uh, cinema, especially towards uh, films uh, from Turkey. Uh, so, John Feda is another film which was mm -hmm. produced this year. I think it was around uh, April, May. Uh, it was also classified as a plus uh, 18. Uh, so, there are lots of uh, restrictions towards 
Turkish films mm -hmm. uh, produced here in Turkey. So do you think that the rise of the far right is to blame for these actions? Uh, definitely the rise of the far right uh, is playing uh, a key role here in uh, this case as well. Uh, last week, uh, The Guardian published an interesting analysis uh, which says that one in four uh, Europeans vote for far-right and populist parties. On the other hand, I think we need to uh, bear in mind three important points. One is, uh, as I mentioned before, the rise of uh, populism in Europe mm -hmm. and in Germany in particular. The second is uh, the integration slash assimilation policies of Germany. Mm -hmm. And the third is the rise, the increasing rise and dominance and impact of Turkey in regional politics. Mm -hmm. So if we consider, if we uh, study these three facts uh, carefully, we will understand why this kind of films, this kind of harmless films, I need to say, uh, are banned, are partly and banned in Germany. And they have these restrictions as well. Well, Tan Ardoğan, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you for having me on. Edward Byrne Jones was the last of the pre-Raphaelites. Born during the Industrial Revolution, he turned away from modernity to reimagining myths, legends, and fairy tales of the past. That history is being brought to life with the UK's largest retrospective of his work for a generation. Showcase's Miranda Addy tells us more. The Edward Byrne Jones exhibition at the Tate Britain is vast. The 150 objects on display illustrate his skill not only as a painter, but as a draftsman, a colorist, and a designer. Born under the much plainer name of Ted Jones in 1833, he abandoned a degree at Oxford to join the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, a group of artists who included William Holman Hunt, John Everett Millet, and Byrne Jones's idol, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And like them, he was obsessed with the past. Edward Byrne Jones was really fascinated by medieval literature and history and legends and tales. Tales from the past, myths, legends, and this kind of imagined world that he would create to bring these to life for his audience and his art-loving public. Those tales include the adoration of the Magi, which reimagines the three kings visiting Jesus in the nativity scene, and Laos Veneras, which depicts Venus pining for the knight who left her. Perhaps the star of the show is this room. Ben James's reimagining of the myth of Perseus is set across 10 glorious paintings. It is quite simply epic. The Perseus paintings feature an array of mythical characters, from Medusa to Atlas and the three nymphs. Sleeping Beauty was another fairy tale Burne Jones turned into a sequence. The wonderful Briar Rose series, Sleeping Beauty, not a narrative series in the sense of the Perseus series, not showing a continuation or a story from one element to a beginning and an end. We have halfway through um, a single moment captured in time with the prince arriving at the scene and the princess herself, the sleeping beauty, awaiting the kiss, awaiting to be woken from this slumber. But it isn't all just paintings. Stained glass window commissions were Burne Jones's bread and butter. He had a keen sense of humour. In these cartoons, he's made his friend, the designer William Morris, much larger than he was. He created tapestries, and even decorated this piano as a birthday gift for the daughter of his patron. As his career develops, his artistic output develops, and we have him kind of as this kind of transitional figure from what we call pre-Raphaelite art into symbolism, aesthetic art towards the end of the 19th century, where narrative isn't quite so important, and it's more to do with idea and form, um, colour, structure. So he's an artist that's really radical, inventing new ideas, inventing new compositions, and transforming art in the late 19th century into something quite new and something that would then transform into modernism in the 20th century. 
Edward Byrne Jones at the Tate will remain on display until February 2019. It offers a glimpse into a world of myths and legends, magic and fairy tales. It's the best of Byrne Jones' imagination and the final swan song of the Pre-Raphaelites. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Well, that's it for Showcase. Remember, you can always visit our YouTube channel for more stories about the international art scene. From me, Efnan Han, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching and see you next time.